Hello! Today we're going to discuss power, the concept of power, and the two apparatuses that are used to maintain power. The first one is repressive state apparatuses, and the second is ideological state apparatuses. Um, first, let's identify and define what power is as a team. Power is defined as the capacity or the ability to direct or influence the behavior of others or the course of events. At its pure definition, power is not automatically a dangerous thing. In fact, um, why do people crave for power? Psychologists have asserted that when, if we define power as authority, it's actually a very natural instinct for people. Leon Seltzer, PhD, list down four common reasons why people crave power the first one is we have a it is in our human nature we have survival instinct we need power so that we can survive in this world we need power so we can gather the material resources that we need in order to survive so that's a very healthy look at power when does it become unhealthy when the unquenchable desire for material possessions become, well, unquenchable. When you are gathering resources, not just to survive or to live a comfortable life, but to feel a desire that never gets full. And to an extent that you are taking away resources from other people in order for you to live, then that look at power becomes unquenchable. That look at power becomes dangerous. Remember, while you have a human nature, you have a survival instinct, other people's survival instinct, need to survive, must also be taken into consideration. When you take away too much resources because of your unquenchable desire, that makes power dangerous. When you have the capacity to get resources and you have the power, it needs you need to take into consideration your need to survive, but other people's need to survive too. If physical need to survive is one way, one reason why we, we crave for um, power. The other is there is an emotional need. Our mental health needs, uh, we have a natural craving for respect, for adoration, for homage. We want to be able to feel good um, in this world. And that is it's okay. It's okay to want to be respected for to want to to be um, adored by people when does it become dangerous when your need to be adored verges on the extreme when your need to be adored makes you want to exploit other people or when you want uh, when your adoration comes at the expense of other people, then power as authority becomes dangerous. So when taken to an extreme, power as authority becomes dangerous. Apart from this, um, other psychologists, the most recent psychologists, um, have studied and they actually define power not just as authority but autonomy. Joris Lammers, uh, Jan Kastoker, Florinx. I don't know if this is if I've correctly, uh, I tried. <laughs> I tried to correctly pronounce your name. I hope I'm right. Um, but these researchers have asserted in a new study in 2006 that the desire for power is not because they want, people want authority, but because they, people want autonomy or the freedom to determine one's own destiny power itself is not a bad thing 
even if we define power as authority, when it is used to, sur to, to take care of your need to survive or to take care of your mental need, and it used in moderation, it is fine. But it becomes dangerous when taken to an extreme. Okay? So that's power. Now, we'll look at the state. Um, of course, there are a lot of people and we are all fighting for resources. But resources are scarce. So we need a body or a governing body, uh, um, an institution that will take care of uh, resources, of how resources will be distributed among people. And so we come up with a concept of state. So how do we define state? State is defined as a nation or territory considered as an organized political community under one government. Again, a state could be exactly what we need, exactly what we need in order to survive and to live a comfortable life. But because we are living in scarce res and we have scarce resources, power struggle inevitably arises. A power struggle is a situation where two or more people or groups compete for control in a particular sphere. So a power struggle becomes a natural part of a, a state. Or our of our community of our life now how do states maintain power in order to get ahead how do states maintain power and once again if we look at power power is neither bad nor good as we have already described um, but it can be a dangerous thing if the power is an exploitative one or a dictatorial one. Um, how do states maintain power? Louis Althusser, a French Marxist philosopher, posited two ways that those in power maintain their dominance. The first one is called repressive state apparatuses. Repressive state apparatus, one, that's the singular form. Repressive state apparatuses, that's the plural form. Let's define it. The repressive state apparatuses consist, consist of the army, the police, the judiciary, and the prison system. It operates primarily by means of mental and physical coercion and violence that may be latent or actual. It is also dubbed as hard power. In order to maintain dominance, states employ repressive state apparatuses again in a community right in a community where everything is fair and just and equitable police the army the judiciary and the prison system have a very important uh, important roles to play they keep the law right they keep the, the system the just system the problem arises when those that are in power are dictatorial or exploitative. Then the police, the judiciary, the army, and the prison system become a part of how they will maintain their power. If you did not follow what the state wants, they will torture and kill the people. Of course, people's human instinct, the instinct to survive, will kick in. And they will be silenced. Again, repressive state apparatuses, if used to maintain a proper just environment have important roles to play but if if it is used to maintain an exploitative power 
that it becomes a killing machine that silences and kills people who disagree with the dominant power. Repressive state apparatuses. That's the first one. The second one is what we call ideological state apparatuses. It's easy to understand, right? In the face of guns, we say yes. But ideological state apparatus, singular form, I, ideological state apparatuses, plural form, operates on a subtle but more powerful way. What is it? Ideological state apparatuses are systems and institutions that legitimate and reproduce the state by producing consent. Examples include institutions such as education, media, family, religion, trade, law, etc., which are formally outside state control but are used to transmit the values of the dominant power. This is also dubbed a soft power. What's really difficult for the ideological state apparatuses to, to spot is that it works in the mindset of people. Um, how does it work? For example, again, ideological state apparatuses if used to maintain a just and fair environment or state, have a very important role. However, if they are used to maintain an exploitative power, a dictatorial power, then it could be extremely dangerous. How does it work? For example, Institutions such as education. In education, people are not taught critical thinking skills. People only learn about the biography of this certain dictator and nothing else. People only learn about the mindset of this power of this dominant power and nothing else, then education becomes a way for those in power to maintain their power. If education becomes a puppet to a tool that those in power are used to keep the people subdued, then it becomes an ideological state apparatus of an exploitative power. For example, it's possible that a dictator could use education as a silencing mechanism. In school, teachers are not allowed to discuss ideas. Teachers are not allowed... Students are not allowed to disagree. The dictator is only painted as a good person. Then education becomes an ideological state apparatus. Education, by virtue of its core function, which is to widen the minds of the people, must never just perpetrate one ideology one way of looking at things it must always try to be objective try to look at various perspectives and try to look at various ideologies only then can it become an ideological state apparatus that could fight against the dominant power another could be media the media could be used to disseminate the information that are only good for the state. Then, a media could become an ideological state apparatus. Even our family, right? 
um, sometimes our parents, because they studied it, okay, uh, they 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 were forced to learn to parrot the the power, the belief system of the idol of the ones in power. That's what they also parrot to their teacher to their children they told their children that so and so dictator is good and so a family becomes an ideological state apparatus that maintains that so and so dictator's power our parents becomes one our brothers become one so we must always even religion right even religion, right? A religion that is supposedly um, supposed to, to make people uh, choose what's good. If your religion is something that has been used by the state, if it says, vote so-and-so and no one else, then it becomes an ideological state apparatus. It becomes a tool to maintain the power of the state. And to a certain extent, it's a betrayal. It's a betrayal because you must allow, a religion must allow your people the freedom to choose what's good and what's bad. And to not just dictate one version of good. So when your religion asks you to Vote for so-and-so. Ask them why. Ask them why they're saying that. Because if you don't, then you become, your religion becomes an ideological state apparatus that is used to maintain a specific kind of power. If that power is a dangerous power, you, your religion, your family have become instruments that maintained that exploitative power. So be very, very careful. So this is also called soft power. You don't think that you were made to follow the dominant power, but you are. So that's ideological state apparatuses. Alright, so here are the references that I've used and uh, in your own society, I want you to think about the many repressive state apparatuses and the many, many, many ideological state apparatuses that are used by people to maintain power. So that's our lesson for today. The theme is uh, power and the apparatuses that are used to maintain it. My name is Herbal Santiago. I'm an educator. To be exact, I'm an, I'm an international baccalaureate educator. I use this literature to teach social justice. If you want to read more of the works that I've written and the literary essays that I've created as a model essay for my students, please read herbalsantiago.manonulat.wordpress.com. That's it for today. May the odds be ever in your favor and may you never fall for an ideological state apparatus or repressive state apparatuses that protects an exploitative power. That's it. Bye!